Welcome to this series of prophetic presentations focusing on the book of Revelation, especially chapter 14, titled Three Cosmic Messages, Earth's Final Conflict. If you've just joined us for the series, let me summarize a little bit what we've done so far. This is a series of 13 separate presentations that focus on the great prophecies of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, God presents a universal, urgent message for all mankind as outlined in Revelation, the 14th chapter. We've looked at the fact thus far that this message calls all humanity to make eternal choices. The Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, is the very center of the book of Revelation, and he has done everything possible to save us. There's nothing more that Jesus could have done. He is the dying lamb, the one that provides salvation, full and complete for us. He is our living priest that delivers us not only from sin's condemnation, but from sin's power. He is the God also who before the whole universe in the judgment reveals his grace and his goodness. In the judgment, the kingdoms of this earth crumble and the kingdom of Christ triumphs. In our last presentation, we were focusing especially on this subject of the judgment, and we will develop that theme more in this presentation today. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you with all of our hearts that we need not fear the judgment. As we look at Christ, we sense that he stands for us both as our judge and as our advocate, as our attorney in the judgment. We're thankful that we're not left alone, that the one that represents us has never lost a case. So as we probe the timing of the judgment today and sense that we're living in the urgent time of earth's history, a very critical time, open our eyes to have the wisdom from your word in Christ's name. Amen. The title of my presentation today is God's Prophetic Timetable. About two centuries ago, a group of settlers were traveling across the United States. The United States government had just opened up new lands for homestead, and these settlers were traveling there to develop a new community. As they traveled off in the distance, they saw smoke, and they knew that there was a wild prairie fire coming toward them. They recognized that they could not dodge, outrun, or get away from that prairie fire. They wondered what would happen. Would they be burned up, consumed in the fire? One old man who had experience with prairie fires in the past said this. He said, let's begin to burn behind us. Now they recognized that if they burned behind them and burned a large swath of land, they then could get in the center of that burned land. So they started this controlled fire behind them. They burned a large circle of land, then put that smaller fire out. The entire company got into the center of that fire. One little girl spoke up and said, are you sure that we're not all going to be burned up? The fire is coming. It's coming toward us. It's coming rapidly. It's coming quickly. And the old man said, my child, the flames cannot reach us here, for we are standing where the fire has been. Standing in the center of God's love, we stand where the fires of hell have already been. Because on that cross of Calvary, Jesus took all the shame, the condemnation, the guilt of sin. I love that poem. On him almighty vengeance fell, which would have sunk a world to hell. He bore it for a chosen race and thus becomes our hiding place. In earth's final judgment, we have a hiding place. We stand within the circle of his love. Christ was judged as a condemned sinner. So we could be judged as righteous citizens of the heavenly kingdom. He experienced all of the pain, the agony, the suffering of a lost human being as he bore our guilt and bore our shame. That's what Paul meant when he wrote in Galatians 3 verse 13, cursed is everyone that hangs upon the tree. We have nothing to fear because we stand in the circle of God's love in that eternal judgment. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7, 
the Bible says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Now notice, this judgment is a present tense judgment, not the hour of God's judgment will come. The book of Revelation, though, does not give us the timing of that judgment. It does give us a hint, because in Revelation 22, verse 11 and 12, it says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. So if Jesus is coming to give out the rewards, there must be a judgment preliminary to his return to determine who receives what reward when he comes. But yet, although Revelation teaches us that there is a judgment, a pre-advent judgment, previous to the coming of Christ, in which the destinies of all human beings have been settled, in which God's name is honored before the entire universe, the Revelation does not give us the exact timing of that judgment. Now, in Scripture, there are two great prophetic books that speak of end-time events, the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. In this judgment, God takes us back to the book of Daniel. And there in the book of Daniel, an angel explains to Daniel the timing of this judgment that would occur in the book of Revelation. In the book of Daniel, we have the rise and fall of kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, the breakup of the Roman Empire. We've studied this in our last presentation. And then we have the rise of a religious political power. These nations or empires have attempted to usurp God's authority and usurp God's kingdom. But as Daniel is looking at these empires, he looks up into heaven and he sees the great judgment. And there in that judgment, he sees the kingdom of God restored and given to Christ. Daniel looks at that scene in Daniel chapter 7. When we come to Daniel chapter 8, in an explanation of that judgment, Daniel 8 verse 14 says, Unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now you might be asking the question, what does the cleansing of the sanctuary have to do with the judgment? Every Jew would understand that. Once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the sanctuary was cleansed. All year, as sinners confessed their sin, the guilt of that sin went into the sanctuary through the blood of the animal or through the priest eating the animal. As that sin symbolically entered the sanctuary, as it did that, once a year at the end of the Jewish year, there was a day of atonement or the day of the cleansing of the sanctuary where the priest enters into the most holy place of the sanctuary with pure blood. The priest entering in with that pure blood cleanses the sanctuary, comes out and places the guilt upon the scapegoat, and the scapegoat is sent out into the wilderness. So that's the scene. But this day of atonement, this day of the cleansing of the sanctuary is a day of judgment. Every Jew understood that. Every Israelite had to gather around the sanctuary. They had to pray. They had to seek God or else they would be cut off or judged. So when Daniel says, under 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed, it is as if he is saying, then the final day of judgment will occur. Now, obviously, this sanctuary is not the sanctuary on earth, which ceased to exist at the end of the Jewish dispensation. But this must be another sanctuary, the sanctuary in heaven that would be cleansed, cleansed from all of the pollution that comes as God's people confess their sins and Christ bears them there, cleansed in the sense that all of the wickedness and evil on earth would be destroyed as Christ's kingdom was given back to him. Daniel 8, verse 27, as Daniel is thinking about this cleansing of the sanctuary, he doesn't understand quite what it means. He's perplexed over it. He doesn't understand the 2,300 days. Daniel has been thinking about the deliverance of his people. And Daniel says, I was astonished by the vision, but none understood it. So at the end of Daniel chapter 8, Daniel does not understand the vision at all. He's perplexed about it. He is confused. In the Bible, 
one prophetic day equals one literal year. So in Scripture, the 2300 days would actually equal 2300 literal years. Now you might say, Pastor Mark, where is the biblical evidence of that? We find it in two different lines of reasoning. In the Bible, when we have prophecy in symbolic images, the time period is also symbolic. So in Daniel chapter 8, for example, you have a ram representing Medo-Persia, a he-goat representing Greece, and uh, you have symbolic animals. That indicates that the time period be symbolic. The other way we know is that throughout Scripture, the Bible says that um, I've given you a day for a year. One prophetic day equals one literal year. There's another way we know. In Daniel 9, verse 21, it says, Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering, and he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, now notice what the angel says. This is critical. I have now come forth to give you skill and understanding. Daniel doesn't understand the vision, but at the precise moment where he's perplexed, the angel returns in Daniel 9 to explain the vision to him. The angel explains to Daniel that along the timeline of this vision, there would, the Messiah would come, that Christ would be baptized on time, Christ would be crucified on time, that the gospel would go to all humanity on time. So this vision of Daniel 9 is a vision about Jesus, about his baptism, about his death, about the gospel going out to the world on time. This prophecy, though, could not possibly have been fulfilled back in Daniel's day. The Messiah had not yet come. So it must be much more than 2,300 literal days, which was simply taking us six and a half, seven years from Daniel's time. So it points forward to the Messiah. But there's another aspect of this prophecy. The prophecy points not only to the first coming of Jesus and the Messiah, it points down to the final day of judgment and the second coming of Christ. Now, the prophecy does not give us the timing of the second coming of Christ, but it does point out a time of the end, which precisely could not have taken place in Daniel's time. Daniel 8, verse 17, when the angel is explaining it, it says, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Now, it's, there are some people that mistakenly look at this prophecy and believe it applies to one of the ancient rulers who attacked Jerusalem and set up an idol in the Jewish temple called Antiochus Epiphanes. But the language of the prophecy really indicates that this could not possibly have been the case. The prophecy takes us down to the time of the end. Antiochus never did that. The prophecy is a large prophecy, a big prophecy, not talking about something that happened in a Jewish temple, but it's talking about the universal conflict between good and evil, between Christ and Satan. It's talking about the honor of Christ, the kingdom being restored to Christ in the judgment. It's talking about a time period that talks about Christ's baptism, Christ's death, the gospel going to the Gentiles, the time of the end. It it is a call of all humanity that no longer business as usual, no longer pleasures as usual. It's a call to get ready for the coming of Christ. What does Daniel receive? What message does he receive from the angel? Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to what time, everybody? What does scripture say? The time of the end. And I would much rather listen to what the angel says than some philosophy of some human being. This message takes us down to the last days, takes us down to end time. The message in Daniel 8 begins with a battle with this ram and he goat, as we've mentioned. The Bible names them. It names Greece. It names Medo-Persia. Bible prophecy is incredibly detailed. Bible prophecy is incredibly precise. It also talks in this prophecy about a power that would rise out of Rome. It calls it a little horn power. And this power would think to change the very law of God. This power would usurp the authority of God. It would take 
human decrees, human traditions, and place them in stead of the commandments of God. In the cleansing of the sanctuary, at this moment of judgment, God's truth would be restored. So there are a number of things happening in this idea of the judgment or the cleansing of the sanctuary. This is a huge idea. It's a big idea. The idea is the honor of God. The idea is the judgment of all humanity. The idea here is the restoration of God's truth. This is a huge idea. It has to do with the finishing of God's work on earth. Daniel goes to sleep, doesn't quite understand the vision. He prays. In Daniel chapter 9, the angel comes back to explain the vision to Daniel. This vision takes us down the stream of time. This vision enables us to walk through a journey of history. This vision explains key events on the timetable of heaven. Daniel 9, verse 23. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out. And I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Daniel's perplexed. Daniel is confused at the vision. But as he is, the angel comes and says to him, Daniel, you are greatly beloved. This expression is used throughout the book of Daniel. And then the angel says to Daniel, therefore, consider the matter, understand the vision. Consider what matter, Daniel? Understand what vision, Daniel? There is no specific vision given in Daniel chapter 9. The word for vision there is the exact word that was used in Daniel 8. So what the angel is saying to Daniel is, understand the vision that you received in Daniel the 8th chapter. I have come now to explain that vision to you. I have come now to describe the details of that particular vision. Now, did you notice, though, what Daniel, the message Daniel received from the angel? He said, I have come and you are greatly beloved. Have you ever longed for a place of belonging? Have you ever in your own life longed to know that you were loved? Have you ever felt rejected? Have you ever felt lonely and alone? The message of this angel to Daniel at a time of judgment is a message to you. It's a message that you're not alone. You're not an isolated individual on this spinning globe of ash with seven billion other people. Rather, you are cherished by God. You are precious to God. God created you. God fashioned you. Christ redeemed you. Jesus is preparing a place for you in heaven. You, my friend, are greatly beloved. The matter that uh, Daniel was discussing, considering, and the matter that the angel was discussing in chapter 8 when Daniel fainted and didn't understand was the matter of the cleansing of the sanctuary. It was the matter of the 2,300 days. So the angel comes back to explain this to Daniel. And he says to Daniel in Daniel 9, verse 24, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins. Who are Daniel's people? They are the Jewish nation. Who indeed, it, what indeed is the holy city? Jerusalem. So the first part of this prophecy is dealing with the coming of the Messiah to his own people to make reconciliation for iniquity. Notice who did that? The Messiah. To bring in everlasting righteousness. Who did that? The Messiah. To seal up the vision and the prophecy. Who would do that? The Messiah. To anoint the most holy. Who would do that? Jesus would ascend to heaven. He would enter into the sanctuary. He would anoint the holy and most holy place before he began his work in the holy place. He would make that anointing to consecrate the sanctuary. This is a divine timetable. It is precise, it is minute, and it is exact. It is an amazing timetable of history that helps us to understand the credibility of the Bible. The book I hold in my hands is no common book. 
This book is no ordinary book. This book is divinely inspired by God. And the prophecy that we are studying is one of the most magnificent prophecies in the Bible because it takes us down the stream of time. It enables us to understand precise dates that have to do with the very, very life and teachings of Jesus. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, know therefore and understand. Now, when the angel says know something, it's important. When the angel says understand it, it's important. Know and understand. Understand what? From the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Daniel's people were in captivity. They are in captivity to Babylon, then captivity to Medo-Persia. And what the angel is saying to Daniel is this, know and understand, from the time of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, from the time of that decree goes forth, when your people can go back and rebuild the city, establish their nationhood again, establish their worship again, when that can occur, when that decree is passed, know that that's the starting point for this 2300 day or 2300 year prophecy. Now notice what our text says though, know therefore and understand from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The first portion of this prophecy relates to God's people, the Jews. 70 weeks are determined for who? For Daniel's people, the Jews. Now I want you to look at this word determined. The word determined is a very, very fascinating word in the Hebrew language. Let's look at this year-day principle and then look at this word determined. Now remember, 70 weeks are determined for your people. When it's obvious that symbols are symbolic, then the time periods are symbolic, as we've mentioned. 70 weeks are composed of 490 days. Now remember, according to the book of Ezekiel and according to the book of Numbers, one prophetic day equals one literal year. So 70 weeks would be seven times 70, seven days in a week, and that would be 490 days or 490 literal years that would be determined upon God's people. 70 weeks are determined for your people, the Jews. That would be 490 literal years years. Now remember we looked at that word determined. It's an interesting Hebrew word, chatuk, and it means cut off or separate from. So the 490 years are cut off or separate from the 2300 years. They contain the first portion of those 2300 years. They are a smaller section of those 2,300 years. Let's go back to Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 9.25. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah would be seven weeks and 62 weeks or 69 weeks. So 69 of the 70 weeks of the first part of the prophecy would take us down to the Messiah. And then the Bible says in Daniel 9, 25, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So at the beginning of this period of time, the beginning of the 69 weeks, God would pass a decree to allow Israel to go back and rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, establish their worship, be established again as a nation. At the end of that 69 weeks, the Messiah would come. Since there is one prophetic day and equal a literal year, 69 weeks, what would that be? It would be seven times 69. Seven times nine are what? 63. You got it. You're a good math student. Seven times six are 42. We carry our six, 483 prophetic years. Now follow me closely. From the year that the decree would go forth to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah would be 69 prophetic weeks 483 prophetic days or 483 literal years. That would take us down to the Messiah's coming. Well, when did that decree go forth to restore and to build Jerusalem? In actual fact, there were three decrees, one by Cyrus, one by Darius, and one by Artaxerxes. Which decree do we choose 
and why and when did those decrees go out? The first of those decrees by Cyrus was in 538 or 537 BC. The second decree by Darius to let the Jews go back was not long after that, but there, we don't have a clear historical specific date. The, the, four, the third decree by Artaxerxes in 457 BC is very clear date. That's a solid date in history. In fact, the Bible talks about it this way in Ezra 7 verse 13. I issue a decree that all those of the people of Israel and the priests and Levites in my realm who volunteer to go up to Jerusalem may go with you. The decree of Artaxerxes is significant for multiple reasons. One of those reasons is the priests and Levites go to restore worship. Another reason is, is that Artaxerxes provides finances or money for them to go to rebuild their city and reestablish their nation. Another reason is, is at this date that the majority of Jews that went left and went with the Jewish uh, pilgrims that went back to their city. So it is the 457 date that's really significant because it establishes worship and it establishes, again, the ability to build the entire city. So now let's look at the timeline of history. Remember, 483 prophetic days equals what? You're a good student. 483 years. So if the decree goes forth in 457 BC, we have to go forward on the timeline 483 years. Now to make this simple, let's suppose we were going forward on the timeline 457 years. Let's just suppose that. And let's suppose we're taking steps and each year is a step. If we take 457 steps, it would take us down to zero. But there is no zero year in history. So what would that take us down to? Well, if history goes from 1 BC to 1 AD and there's no zero year, it would take us down to AD 1, right? But we're not going 457 years on the timeline. How many do we have to go? Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, 457 BC, to Messiah the Prince shall be what? 69 weeks, seven weeks and 62 weeks. 483 years. So we're not going 457, which would take us to 1. We're going 43. Well, what is 457 from 43? It, that leaves us with another 26 additional years that are needed to complete the 483 years. We have to go 26 more steps forward on this timeline. So 457 BC, and if you go forward 483 years on the timeline, or you go 457 to 1 and 26 more, it takes you to the year 27 AD. What would that take us to? What event? Daniel 9 verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, when was that again? 457 BC, until Messiah the Prince. Who's the Messiah? What does the word Messiah mean? Does anybody know what the word Messiah means? What's that word Messiah mean? It means the anointed one, doesn't it? So from 457 BC, 483 years forward. This is incredible. This is amazing. The decree in 457 went forward in the fall. So 483 years from the fall of 457 would take us to the fall of 27 AD. What happened in the fall of 27 AD? Precisely, Jesus Christ was baptized and the word Messiah means the anointed one. And according to Acts chapter 10, Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit at his baptism. Years in advance, the book of Daniel records that Jesus, the Messiah, would be baptized precisely in the fall of 27 AD, exactly at the age of 30 years old. Jesus, the carpenter of Nazareth, left the carpenter shop at 30. And there he was baptized in 27 AD, exactly like the Bible predicts. Now, the Bible says that three and a half years after the fall of 27 AD, that the Messiah would be cut off, that he would be crucified, but not for himself. If you go three and a half years from 27 AD, that would take you from the fall of 27 to the spring of 31 AD. Let me make it simple for you. If it's three and a half years, and I'll show you from the Bible how this calculates out, but uh, three years from the fall of 27 would take you to the fall of 30. 
Six months later, it would take you to the spring of 31 AD. What do you know, what Jewish feast was taking place in the spring? The Passover. And what do you know about Jesus? Paul says, Jesus, our Passover lamb, was sacrificed for us. Christ, that great Passover lamb. Let's look at this in Daniel's prophecy. Daniel 9, verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, the Messiah, Jesus, the one anointed in 27 AD, shall be cut off, but not for himself. His death was not for himself. His death was for you and for me, the Christ that hung on that cross with those nails through his hands and that crown of thorns upon his head, that Jesus that hung there dying and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Bore the sin of all humanity. He bore our guilt. He bore our shame. That prediction in Daniel chapter 9 points forward to the baptism of Christ, points forward to the crucifixion of Christ. It's, precisely, it's precise and it is amazing. Notice Daniel 9, 26. The people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Eventually, Titus and the Roman armies would come down and destroy Jerusalem. The end of it shall be with a flood. Till the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Now, there are some people that think that this prophecy talks about the Antichrist confirming the covenant in a Jewish temple. But look, in the Bible, there's only one who ever makes a covenant, and that is God making a covenant with his people. There's only one whose blood ever can ratify the eternal everlasting covenant, that's Christ. Throughout this prophecy, it talks about Jesus baptism. It talks about Jesus' crucifixion. Isn't it just like the devil to take this prophecy and turn it around from relating to Christ to relate to the Antichrist power? The Bible is very clear. He, the Messiah, he, Jesus Christ, he, the Savior of all mankind, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And then notice what the prophecy actually says. Seventy weeks are determined for your people, the Jewish nation. 490 prophetic days or literal years. By 27 AD, 69 of those weeks or 483 years were used up. There's one prophetic week that is cut off from the 2300 days or years. One prophetic week of those 490 prophetic days or 69 weeks that are left. The week that remains of seven years can be divided into two three-and-a-half-year periods, 27 A.D. to 31 A.D., 31 A.D. to 34 A.D. Here is a divine timetable. The first portion of the prophecy, 69 weeks, runs out in A.D. 27. The next three-and-a-half years run out in A.D. 31. Notice what takes place in that year. Christ, the Messiah, is crucified. Daniel predicted the timing of Christ's death precisely, exactly. You say, how so? Here it is. There is one week that remains. Look what the Bible says. At the end of that week, at the end of that seven years, at the end of the 490 years, the gospel would go to all Muslim, Hindu, Jew, Buddhist, Christian. We're only saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. But in the middle of that last week, before the gospel goes to the Gentiles, what does the Bible say? It says that Christ would be crucified in 31, gospel go to the Gentiles in 34. Then the rest of the prophecy takes us down when? To the very time of the end. The first 490 years of the prophecy were designated for the Jewish nation. The last part of the 2300 years has to do with God's people today. That has to do with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Notice Daniel 8, verse 14. He said to me, For 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. At the end of this 2,300-year prophecy, the sanctuary would be cleansed. The judgment would strike the hour. Now notice, very carefully here, 2,300 days. One prophetic day equals what? One literal year. So if you have 2,300 days or 2,300 years, you take 490 years from that, those 490 years would apply to who? Apply to the Jewish race. You subtract 490 from 2,300, and what does that give you? It gives you 1,800 prophetic days left. 
So the 490 years have to do with the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus. But look, if we take 1810 more steps on the timeline from 34 AD, when the 490 ran out, where does that take us? It takes us down to the year 1844. So you say, what indeed is the significance of 1844? What is that significance? It is this. That in 1844, the clock struck the prophetic hour. In 1844, the destinies of all humanity were to be settled. In 1844, the truth of God's message would be restored to the world. In 1844, God's judgment would begin. And during that process, remember what we read in Daniel chapter 7. Thousand, thousands ministered unto him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set. The books were opened. 490 years reveal earthly events that have to do with the Jews. 69 weeks takes you down to the baptism of Christ. That's something we can see that's verifiable in history, A.D. 27. Three and a half years later, remember the Bible says... He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, the middle of that last prophetic week, he shall cause the sacrifices to cease. Three and a half years from 27 A.D. Takes you down to the spring of 31 A.D. That's a verifiable event. It's something you can see. It's tangible. It's a historical event. Three and a half years later, 34 A.D., the Messiah reaches out now beyond the Jewish race. The gospel goes to the Gentiles. The disciples in the book of Acts preach the living word of God to the ends of the earth. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. He said, go you there and teach what? All nations, all nations, teaching them whatsoever I've commanded you. Go make disciples of all nations. I'm with you to the ends of the earth. So after 34 AD, the gospel of God's grace, the gospel of God's goodness was to go to all the world. 490 years, the prophecy concludes in 34 AD. Those are verifiable historical events. But God ties a heavenly event that we cannot see tangibly with our eyes to a earthly events that are anchored in history so we can have the assurance, so we can have the confidence, so we can have the absolute certainty that what God said would take place in heaven at the end of the 2300 years indeed is a reality. This is no figment of our imaginations. This is no pipe dream. This is no, no magic formula, some rabbit pulled out of a hat someplace and fanciful interpretation of Bible prophecy. This is anchored in history, anchored in earthly events. There's a divine timetable that has been filled throughout the history of our world. 27 AD, AD 31, AD 34. Now the time of the end in 1844. No longer business as usual. No longer pleasures as usual. We are living at a unique time of Earth's history. These events are the culmination of the great controversy between good and evil from the time that Adam and Eve sinned. From the time that Adam and Eve left the garden, they looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. Every slain lamb pointed forward to the coming of Jesus Christ and he came, tabernacled in human flesh, Live the life we should have lived. Faced every temptation that Satan could have thrown at him. The Bible says he was tempted, Hebrews chapter 4, at all points like we are yet without sin. Jesus gained the victory in his life. And even in his death, Satan could not destroy him. On that cross, he triumphed, according to Colossians 2, verse 14, 15, and 16, over the principalities and powers of hell. This resurrected Christ has ascended to heaven. This resurrected Christ reaches out to you and me today. But this resurrected Christ will come again. He will stream down the corner of the sky. The heavens will be illuminated with the glory of God. He will come. But before he comes, 
the great judgment takes place before a waiting world, before a watching universe, Jesus himself reveals his majesty, reveals his love. When names come up in judgment, before the whole universe, Jesus steps forth. He says, could I have done anything else to save Mark Finley? Could I have done every, anything else to save Harry or John or Mary or Sally? I've done everything I could. I sent my Holy Spirit to draw them to me. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that God puts eternity in our hearts. The Bible says in John chapter 1 that Christ is the light that lights every man that comes into the world. Every person born into this world has the light of the Holy Spirit in their hearts that's drawing them to Jesus. Before the judgment bar of God, before the universe, Jesus said, could I have done anything else? I sent my Holy Spirit to draw them to me. I arranged providences in their life so that they would understand my love. Jesus says, I, I left heaven. And I descended into the realms of earth. I tabernacled in human flesh. I lived as a human being. I faced every temptation in common with man. Could I have done everything, anything else? And the whole universe says, just and righteous are your ways, O Lord. You've done everything you possibly could do. One of the things that the judgment will reveal is that any human being that is lost is not lost because they did not have the opportunity. Revelation's judgment reveals that men and women are lost not because they didn't have the opportunity, but because they did not take advantage of the opportunities that they had. You're not watching this broadcast on three cosmic messages, Earth's final conflict by accident. I am convinced that we are living in the final hours of earth's history. And I'm convinced that we're living in the judgment hour, that the destinies of all humanity will soon be settled, and that Christ is appealing to you right now. He is giving you that opportunity as you view this program to make an eternal decision. Three cosmic messages, three angels flying in the middle of heaven. I saw another angel, that first angel's message that we're studying flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God. We'll study that in our next presentation. What does that mean? Give glory to God. What does that mean? For the hour of his judgment is come. In 1844, the clock struck the hour. Jesus has entered into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. God is making his final appeal to mankind right now. This is no time to be playing around on the edges of faith. This is no time to be playing around on the periphery of religion. This is no time to be playing games. This is a time to get serious about our faith a time to be on our knees repenting before God, a time to open our hearts to his grace, his love, and his mercy. This indeed is God's judgment hour. Soon the great controversy between good and evil will be ended. Soon Christ will say, ladies and gentlemen, it's closing time. The kingdoms of this earth have reigned for temporarily. When you look back at the history of Daniel and Revelation, we find there in Daniel and Revelation, Babylon rises and falls. It reigns from 605 B.C. to 539. Medo-Persia rises and falls. It reigns from 539 to 331 B.C. Greece rises and falls. It reigns from 331 to 168 B.C. Rome rises and falls, and it reigns from 168 B.C. to about 351 A.D. Rome falls apart, these ten divisions in Daniel. These are great cosmic periods. And Rome falls apart, ten divisions of Rome, and then multiple other divisions from about 351 to 476 A.D. A religious political power rises. In all of these powers, the devil attempts to usurp God's authority. 
But Daniel looks at the judgment. And as he does, he looks from earth to heaven. And there he sees the divine sitting of the court of the universe. There he sees Jesus come to the Father. And there he sees the kingdom being given to Christ. In the book of Revelation describes these final events of earth's history. It describes the final conflict in earth's history. It describes powers rising. It describes amazingly the rise of a religious political power out of Rome. It describes a period of persecution. Revelation that we'll be studying describes the rise of America in Bible prophecy. It describes troublous times called the time of trouble. But it describes this final judgment. It describes Jesus receiving the kingdom. It describes the triumph of Christ in the last days of earth's history. God in these last days is restoring truth that has been obscured by human tradition. Daniel 8, 14, unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed, then truth will be restored. You know, it's interesting. Another word for cleansed there is restored. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be restored. What's that all about? Since 1844, God would raise up on earth in harmony with his final work in heaven, where he is cleansing heaven's sanctuary, where he is declaring the righteousness of Christ sufficient to forgive, to cleanse, to change his people. In harmony with that, Jesus would raise up a movement on earth, a divine movement of destiny under 2,300 days, then the sanctuary would be cleansed or restored. This divine movement would restore the truth about Jesus, the truth that we need not have the earthly sacrifice of human masses, that we need not have earthly priests, but that Jesus is the one mediator between God and man, that Christ's sacrifice is complete, Christ's sacrifice is enough, Christ's blood is enough, the cross is enough to save all humanity. He would raise up a movement that would point to Jesus as our dying lamb, but Jesus as our living priest, that through his love, power, and grace, our lives could be changed. Through his love, power, and grace, we could be made over again. He would provide in that message of the restoration of the sanctuary, the truth about the living priesthood of Christ, Jesus says, Hebrews 7, 25, he ever lives to make intercession for us. He is there in the sanctuary for us. We need not an earthly temple. We need not an earthly sanctuary. We need not earthly sacrifices. We need not earthly priests. We have a high priest, Jesus. We have a heavenly sanctuary that we can look to. You see, the evangelical world, and I say it humbly, most of the evangelical world is making a significant mistake. They're looking to an earthly temple. They're looking for an antichrist to enter that earthly temple. They are looking for an earthly solution. Jesus is in the heavenly tabernacle. Jesus' eyes are to focus us on his heavenly tabernacle. Our Roman Catholic friends make a similar mistake. They look at earthly priests. They look at an earthly priesthood, an earthly sacrifice of the mass. But the key events in earth's history right now, the key events that will settle this controversy between good and evil in the universe is God restoring the truth about the heavenly sanctuary, God restoring the truth about his sacrifice, God restoring the truth about his heavenly priesthood, God restoring the truth about his law that has been violated, desecrated by human beings. God is pointing us to the heavenly sanctuary where the law is the very foundation of his government. And God invites us to come on our knees to seek him. He is the one that longs to present our case before the very throne of God. But you say, 1844, we are living now in the 21st century. Think about how long that has been since that event took place, since the judgment began. May I remind you that in the days of Noah, Noah preached the coming judgment 
he preached the coming of the flood waters for 120 years. Think about the largeness of the population since Noah's time. Why did God have Noah preach for 120 years? Oh, you say to build the ark. It took him 120 years. Don't you think that God could have built that ark a lot quicker than 120 years? See, God's intent was to give everybody a chance. God's intent was to give everybody an opportunity. So Noah preached the coming flood, the coming judgment for 120 years. The population of this world is a lot larger than Noah's day. And so the message that's going out is a message of the time of the end, that you and I are living in the judgment hour, that you and I are living at the time of the end. Since 1844, time has been running out. In Noah's day, very few people recognized what was going on. And in our day, very few people recognized what was going on. But God has a message, an eternal message, and his eternal message is circling the globe right now. And although we do not know the exact hour of Christ returning, we do know that time is running out. We do know that we're living at the time of the end. We do know that God is making a final appeal to mankind. It may be at morn. It may be at midnight. We do not know the exact hour. But we do know that this is decision time. This is the time of the judgment. This is the time to make an eternal choice for Christ. Why not make that choice right now as Charles comes and sings? It may be at morn when the day is awaking When the sunlight through darkness and shadow is breaking That Jesus will come in the fullness of glory to receive from his earth his own. Oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long ere we shout the glad song? Christ returned, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah. It may be at midday, it may be at twilight, it may be perchance at the blackness of midnight will burst into light in the blaze of his glory when jesus received his own oh lord jesus how long how long ere we shall the glad song christ returned Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, amen. Will the host cry, Hosanna, from heaven descending, with glorified saints and the angels attending. With grace on his brow, like a halo of glory, when Jesus receives his own. Oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long, ere we shall the glad song return hallelujah hallelujah amen, amen. 
Alleluia, Amen. Alleluia, Amen. There is nothing more that Jesus wants than for you to be with him in heaven. There in the judgment of God, before the judgment bar of God, Jesus is there. He's there for you. He's there representing you. He's there pleading for you. He's there interceding for you. The desire of his heart is that you be with him through all eternity. The, the longing of his mind he has one thought on his mind, and that's you. He knows your name. He knows the challenges that you go through. He's there to strengthen you, to encourage you right now. Will you open your heart to him at this moment? Will you say, Jesus, I am yours as we pray. Father in heaven, the judgment could be incredibly fearful if we had to stand in the judgment alone. We sense anew today, afresh, that we are living just before your return. We sense anew that the clock has struck the hour. We confess our sins. We open our hearts for the grace of Christ. And we thank you and praise you that you're standing in the judgment for us and that in Christ, we will be victorious. In Jesus' name, amen. Be sure to join us for each of these presentations. In our next presentation, I'll be looking at that first, ver first angel's message again, Revelation 14 and verse 7. And we'll be talking about what does it mean to fear God? What does it mean to give glory to God? Be sure to join us. God bless you.